Greetings, everybody. It's time for Bible study on this, the second day of February, 2013, and the 20th day of Shabbat. As I said last week, the Jewish calendar is two days ahead of us. And they have the 22nd day of Shabbat because they declared the new moon before there was a new moon because they're going by an artifice <coughs> in the mathematically constructed calendar which just projects new moons off into the future and, and according to certain calculations that they've made without really looking at the new moons and the uh, stars in the sky and the, the moons as they rise in Jerusalem they just and quit doing that since the days of the, when the temple was destroyed, basically. Uh, they've just gotten away from that, especially in the 357-358 A.D., which was when Rabbi Hillel II and the Jewish leadership decided to go by a fixed calendar to get around the restrictions that the Roman Empire had placed upon Jewish calendar making. They said no more Jewish calendars in the Roman Empire and so they complied and got rid of the calendar by observation and this went by mathematics. In other words, the Roman Empire dissolved the Sanhedrin which is the body of uh, law, religious law in Israel and when they dissolved the Sanhedrin and there was no public uh, office to determine the new moons anymore. And so they got around that by per creating a, per a perpetual calendar. Well, anyway, <coughs> anyway, today is the 20, 20th day of Shabbat, and we are approaching the final month of the year. Another week it'll be Nisan, uh, rather, Adar, which is a month when Purim occurs, and then we'll back, be back into the first month of the new year, in the month of Nisan, or Abed. I have a couple of letters I want to share with you here. Three letters to begin the services today. One is from <clears throat> the man back east, a brother in the church. He says, thank you, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Dankenbring, thank you for the prayers you've extended and advice you've given me over the past year and thank you and the rest of the family who call in to share in the Bible study, uh, study, Sabbath Bible study. I really enjoy the fellowship you give and the points you make and the food for thought that you feed me. For those two precious hours a week, I don't feel so alone in my beliefs. Please let me know when you are sending out the 2012 statements to tithe payers. I'm getting ready to render to Caesar again. And I, as I said in my email to you a year ago, I'll take the deduction if Caesar grants it, <laughs> which is certainly what people do. And we are a charitable organization, so contributions given to the church, the work, uh, are tax deductible. He goes on to say, I have to admit I've been tempted to stop tithing. Even as I contemplated this, I realized that any financial difficulties I may be facing are entirely my fault, not God's or God's servants. God's promised to reward faithful tithe payers, but not necessarily in material ways. And of course, I pray those may come. Two, like God's servant Jabez, may God soon enlarge my territory so that I may be a blessing, not a pain to others in need. May all of our baskets overflow with bread and fish to feed 5,000 with scraps left over. I thought that was a nice letter. I enjoyed that and I agree. May all our baskets overflow bread and fish to feed 5,000 or more as God determines. Through the multiplication of resources by His Holy Spirit, 
as God is able to do it, all we have to do is have faith and persevere. As I've quoted other times in the past, uh, we must endeavor to persevere to the end, as Christ said. <clears throat> the next letter is from a brother who I, I believe I, I put in charge as a leader and correspondent in the church <coughs> the church of God in uh, Kenya in Nahiwa, Kenya and he writes and says greetings to all there at the work it has taken long to communicate nevertheless things are not so bad we call it back to your letter <coughs> dated December 28, 2010, which I applied in affirmative with all joy, I have taken the task to visit the readers of Prophecy Flash in some parts of Kenya. I am glad some who requested these visits were having good reasons for doing so. I am sincerely, from the bottom of my heart, uh, seeing, I guess, that TPM, Church of God, has made us different. The man told us in Nakuru that your church completely teaches the whole will of God, but you refuse to be radical so that the churches can turn around to look where you are. This was a big challenge to us. From that day, we vowed to act as those sent by the powerful beings, Yahweh, our Father, and Yeshua, his Messiah. We have taken the step called Vision 2017. By that we mean that if God's plan brings us to a jubilee, in that year, as you indicated, them, it will get us with a drastic change in this country. We need to learn much from you, but not because you haven't done much. You have put the church on a firm ground that no one should fear even persecution. You've taught the Lord's feasts and festivals in a way that no questions can arise from within the church of God. It will not be a business as usual. The remnant church of God's must hear these truths because the horse is going on laughing at modern ministers and foolish pastors. He says, that's from your quote in the PF, 2007, on the back page, which was the cartoon of a horse laughing at a lot of the modern ministers and their tank, uh, hijinks and false doctrines. Therefore, he says, watch Kenya. Thank you for the PF magazines that constantly come to the subscribers under the Hiwa congregation groups. I would request that you put more weight on sending literature to us. Early dates for new moons and festivals. You can email me for any clarification as I am going to send updates through the same system. Hope to, hope to send photos, possibly, by surface mail. I had another letter I wanted to read. I wonder if I left it in the back office in the in the south office by the computer there. Oh, it's a, yeah, would you please? It's a letter from a... Is it a handwritten one? No, it's an email letter. But I'll go on. Uh, I got a, a news report. I thought this was also very interesting. Uh, Russia has record snow. Sydney, Australia has record heat. Is the magnetic field of the Earth reversal throwing the planet's weather into chaos? They have the uh, they have a extinction protocol being a magnetic polar shift and weather extremes occurring on the Earth. And these seem to have begun to already occur this year. 
the article says, many doomsday theorists have tried to take this natural geological occurrence and suggest it could lead to Earth's destruction. But the answer from a geological point of view and fossil records from hundreds of past magnetic polarity reversals seems to be no. But they don't lead to the Earth's destruction. But they do lead to changes on the Earth and and uh, epochs and uh, d different weather patterns and sometimes they can be quite uh, difficult like the ice ages. On page two of the article it shows a big snowbank in Alaska. It says while, record, Ru while, while northern Russia seen, sets records of snowfall and cold temperatures, Sydney, Australia in the southern hemisphere is experiencing soaring temperatures up to 115 degrees Fahrenheit. Is this the only the beginning of climate changes still to come? It's quite uh, Quite, quite interesting. No, no, thank you. That's not good. <clears throat> okay. I think, uh, Weather extremes are certainly part of what's predicted in the prophecies dealing with the last days before the coming of the Messiah. In uh, Luke, Luke chapter 21, it makes it plain that men's hearts would be stirred up with fear and perplexity at the signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars with the temperatures changing and the waves of the sea roaring. In the article, did you see it in my videos? <clears throat> no. It says unrelenting snowfalls <clears throat> have caused unprecedented chaos in Russia. Over the past week, the country has seen scores of traffic accidents, flight delays, and in some cases, the complete isolation of remote settlements and towns. The snowstorms have caused inconvenience for large population centers in western Russia, and they have been life-threatening further east in the country. Falling snow and ice caused many accidents due to poor visibility and bad road conditions. Moscow suffered and the people are suffering. The polar circle city of Norilsk has been buried under 10 feet of snow. Entire apartment blocks, markets, snow stores, and offices were buried under snow overnight. Can you imagine that 10 feet of snow burying a whole city? Banks of snow were seen as high as two people put together, reaching the second story windows of some apartment buildings. This is all that's there. Okay, so it's really bad news in Russia, and I'm thankful I'm not living there. I prefer Omak. We have about a foot of snow, or maybe eight inches left on the ground, except where it's drifted higher. But I, I, mean, I am able to go down to the chicken coop every day or so, and. <laughs> collect chicken eggs and yesterday I went down there and collected 12 eggs. Wow. And that's for about the last for the last three days I guess because two days ago I went down there and the chicken was sitting on the nest so I didn't get any eggs that day. And then I skipped the day before and yesterday I went down and there they were all in one nest, 12 eggs. So I figured she was probably sitting on about four which I didn't see that day. 
So anyway, we're being blessed with eggs, fresh eggs, organic eggs. And the weather's not so extreme that I can't walk down there and take care of it. My brother was so frustrated a few years ago. They had a snowfall here in Omak in the winter, and he had about three feet of snow, or <clears> two <throat> feet. Then he was up to his head. And uh, he had chickens, and he was so frustrated shoveling out the path down to the chicken coop for those chickens that he virtually vowed never to have chickens again. And after that winter, he, they got rid of the chickens. <laughs> <coughs> But Kathy got inspired last summer, and we were visiting the feed store, and she heard these and saw these beautiful little baby chicks in there for sale, and and her heart just went out to that, and she just thought, I'm going to do it, and she got four chicks, and we raised them up. Well, she says I kept asking her, and I think maybe I was teasing her, want to have chickens this year, baby chicks? <coughs> but she she got them and she volunteered and they've been real nice you know it, it kind of warms your heart when you got the little baby chicks <coughs> being taken care of in your kitchen and in a box and with light in there and feed and then when they get bigger you have to take them down and we had someone fix up our chicken coop for us and, and they're just doing great they're wonderful little ladies then. They're all doing their job, putting their heart into their work. Mm -hmm. The way we ought to all do. <laughs> and their work is producing eggs. And they're laying good eggs. Mm -hmm. Okay, another article here. North Korea. Electronic uh, magnetic pulse attack could destroy U.S. America right now. <coughs> It says, and the article says, North Korea now has an intercontinental ballistic missile, or ICBM, capable of delivering a nuclear weapon to the United States. This was demonstrated by their successful launch and orbiting of a satellite December 12 of last year. In fact, the Washington Times reports that North Korea is a mor mortal nuclear threat to the United States right now. So says the Washington Times. It's not just the threat of conventional nuclear attack that has experts worried, nor is the North Korea invasion scenario in the new remake of a movie called Red Dawn. But the real concern is that North Korea now has miniaturized nuclear weapons for ballistic missile delivery. And they've armed the missiles with nuclear warheads that could destroy the U.S. in a single blow with an EMP attack, electronic magnetic pulse, which would send the U.S. back to the Stone Age, or back to the 19th century technology. If you ever watch the TV show Revolution, which is fiction, uh, you'll know what they're talking about. I've never watched it, but it's about a post-apocalyptic America living back in the Stone Age. No electricity, no power grid, gangs roving the countryside looking for food. You know, the post-apocalyptic America. North Korea is not the only threat either. Other nations and rogue players call America the Great Satan, including Iran. Imagine, it says, if all the lights in America went off, never to come back on again. Imagine if all the computers got fried, never to come back on again. Imagine if all the cars, depending on fancy circuitry, wouldn't start ever again. Imagine if the grocery lines had to close up for good. That's the kind of scenario an EMP attack can cause. The scenarios suggest massive starvation, lawlessness, and chaos beyond anything Americans can imagine. It would be worse than the Civil War days under Abraham Lincoln. 
A new book is out now blowing the whistle on America's vulnerability to such a cataclysmic catastrophe. It's called The Nation Forsaken by defense expert Michael Malouf. Scientists and others have warned for years that America's electrical grid and other critical infrastructures have an almost complete dependency on electricity and electric, electronic components, and they're highly vulnerable to an electromagnetic, electromagnetic pulse event, either from nature, from solar winds and solar explosions on the sun, or from man-made causes like nuclear weapons. Congress knows about the problems and the dangers, but they haven't done anything about it except table it and study it and, and then get involved in politics as usual. So the danger remains and we won't find any help from Congress. They'll, they'll take action when it's too late. And that, that's, that, that's the way of human nature. You wait till it's too late, then you just suffer the consequences. The wise man, God says in the book of Proverbs, the prudent man looks well to his going, and looks ahead and sees the danger and gets out of the way. But the simple man, simple-minded, the simpletons, the naive, the, the congressional idiots, just walk on as if nothing ever happened and the calamity falls. Okay, we found the letter that I wanted to read. Which leads right into the Bible study. And this is uh, <clears throat> on January 25, sent to me by email. And the writer says, I hope you are having a special Sabbath. I've often come across your site ever since I read your excellent article on Herbert Armstrong and the various scandals he was associated with during his life. I greatly appreciated your honesty in recounting the sorry tale and speaking the truth of many who still look up to him as a prophet or something, <coughs> something other than a fallible man, might find too hard to hear. That is, he wasn't the Elijah to come or some other fulfillment of scripture. Well, you know, a lot of people have been misled and they're still misled about that and they still virtually worship the footsteps of Herbert Armstrong even though they ought to know better. We should all know better. God wants his people to all of us to grow up you know, and to act like mature adults and quit following men and worshiping men and thinking that we've got all the truth. We don't need to worry about doctrine anymore because we've been taught by Herbert Armstrong and by whichever church branch claims to follow him the most today, they, they're going to stick with the one they're comfortable in, whether it's United or Living Church or one other offshoot. There are a lot of offshoots today. And they all look up to, to Mr. Armstrong and revere him and put him up on a pedestal. Well, there's no saying that those who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. And Mr. Armstrong lived in a glass house. Or you might call it a fishbowl. And things have become knowledge. Books have been written about his peccadillos and his shortcomings and his sins and faults and and even worse is doctrinal errors, of which some were quite massive. But yet he also had a lot of truth, you know, so it's a conundrum. It's a perplexity. How could someone have so much truth and still have the problems that the church had back in those days? Well, I'm not going to throw stones, but I want to hurl or, or shoot arrows of truth and not at him he's not the target but 
but we want to get back to the faith once delivered to the saints. And we're never going to get there if we follow Herbert Armstrong and just believe everything he said or the different churches say. We need to get back to the Bible. He used to tell a joke about those. this program used to be on the radio years ago called Back to the Bible. And he would demonstrate this during the Feast of Tabernacles by standing up in the pulpit in front of the whole congregation and say, well, this is what they mean by turning back to the Bible. And he would turn around with his, with his back to the audience, turning his back on the audience. And it would be a big laugh, and everybody would get the point that this program that talked about getting back to the Bible was really not doing it. It was ignoring the Bible, turning its back on the Bible. Well, there were times when Herbert Armstrong did the same thing. He ignored the scriptures. He couldn't understand. He was not a genius. He was not a scholar by any means. He was a man, a practical man, but he made a lot of mistakes in doctrine. He went way too far on healing to where he wouldn't take drugs or medicines or even have surgery. And his family members died because of his stubborn truculence on that subject. Later on, he himself did take medicines when he was sick with heart, heart, uh, congenital heart failure and different things. He had it as an older man. Just. But that you know, the healing was one doctrine, and the divorce and remarriage. He was way off on that, way off on the race question, or way off on prophecy. He made so many false predictions and prophecy that it boggles the mind. He, he said the uh, English-British Navy going down to fight the Falkland War with, with uh, Argentina would be basically wiped off the map and suffer a serious defeat by Bible authority. He put that in a co-worker letter to the whole church. Well, the British Navy went down there and boxed the ears of the Argentinians and recaptured the Falkland Islands and restored the glory of Ephraim and Manasseh, the house of Joseph, for a few more years under Margaret Thatcher. He made the prediction before that that man would never get to the moon and return to Earth again. Well, the space program and NASA blew that out of the water. and We landed astronauts on the moon and they came back successfully to Earth on the Saturn V program. <clears throat> well, we have articles on that. But I was intrigued re this week because I got a copy of the <clears throat> United News newspaper by United Church of God. And there was an article in there by Rex Sexton, I think his name was, on Enduring Sound Doctrine. And that was the title. Enduring Sound Doctrine by Rex Sexton. And I was so intrigued, I read it and started off very nice, very good. In the beginning, he was talking about the Sadducees in the New Testament and how they went off and they tried to trick Christ with a trick question. They asked him about this man who married and had a woman and, and he died and then well, yes he had ten brothers and they all had her to wife because each one died and then the brother would take over in what they called the Leverit marriage back in Bible days and then I found last of all according to them the woman died and they said <laughs> to Christ because they do not believe in a resurrection so the, Sad the Sadducees came to Christ and said, Well, Master, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? They thought they had him stumped. There's no answer. It was ten men had her to wife. Who would she belong to in the resurrection? And he said to them, You are sadly mistaken and no, do not know the power of God. You're greatly mistaken. Because in the resurrection, he said they don't marry, and they're not given in marriage, but are as like the angels of God in heaven. 
So they went away and said, well, you've answered very well, Master. He also said, by the way, God is not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. As it says in the law, the book of the law, God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He said he is the God of the living. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, therefore, are going to live again. Because God calls them living. They're going to be living again. So this life isn't all there is to it like the Sadducees thought. Well, so Mr. Sexton does a good job of talking about the Sadducees and where they were off. And he considers their crafty approach and says that's what they did was they used the scripture to try to prove a false doctrine. He said that wasn't new then and it isn't new today. People do that today. People often sound convincing when they twist the scriptures and put their own inflection and their own interpretation onto it. He said there were self-appointed Bible experts back in the first century, just like now. They had their pet ideas that they were experts and clever reasoning to support those ideas. And he talks about the Sanhedrin and the Sadducees and how Jesus answered them and said, Are you not therefore mistaken? Because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God. Like, you know, I say that about the churches today. The churches, the worldwide church of God, the offshoot churches, they claim to teach the truth. They claim to know the scriptures. But they don't really know them, and they, therefore they are guilty of the very same thing the Sadducees were. In fact, they follow the Sadducees. Did you know that? The worldwide church of God, all the offshoots worldwide today has gone back to Babylon. I guess we can write them off. They don't even follow the Sadducees anymore. They're back in the mainstream Protestantism, cross-worship, and Christmas and Easter worship, and paganism. But the other offshoots that came out of Worldwide, they're all hanging on desperately with their fingernails to the doctrines of the Sadducees. He doesn't say that in his article because he's one of them. United is one of them. They're hanging on to the teaching of the Sadducees who taught not just that there was no resurrection. Now, we all know there's a resurrection. But the Sadducees taught that Pentecost should be observed 50 days after the weekly Sabbath during the Days of Unleavened Bread. This was the major, or one of the major differences between them and the Pharisees. The Pharisees, Jesus said, stood in, or sat in Moses' seat. And he said, whatever they teach you, that observe and do. That they were had authority from from the Bible, from Moses' seat, the Torah, in other words. <coughs> they were the interpreters of the law. And whatever they said to do, he said, that do. Unless it contradicts Scripture. When they went into their traditions and they got into contradictions, they began to con contradict with their traditions. But when they taught from the law of Moses, they taught the truth. He said, that observe and do. But the Sadducees, he said, you are sadly mistaken, or greatly mistaken, because you don't know the scriptures or the power of God. The Sadducees keep Pentecost on the wrong day. The churches of God all follow the Sadduce Sadducees, like the Pied Piper of Hamlin, like children following the Pied Piper. And they think that they have the truth. Anybody else they think is a heretic. <coughs> they have assumed to be true what they've not proven. They say follow the scriptures, but they don't even look in the scriptures. Because the scriptures prove the Sadducees are wrong. In fact, the Apostle Paul boasted in the book of Acts and in Philippians that he was a Jew of the Pharisees. A Pharisee of the Pharisees is parents were Pharisees, he learned at the feet of Gamaliel, 
the chief Pharisee, and he said he kept all the laws of God perfectly, blamelessly from his youth. Well, he was a Pharisee, and they, they kept Pentecost 50 days after Passover, not after the Sabbath during Passover week. And Paul said he kept the law perfectly, blamelessly. And he was a Pharisee, not a Sadducee. This is the big issue between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. You can read those story in the book of Acts. The, the council sought to condemn Paul and it was composed of mixed of Sadducees and Pharisees in the council. And they were going to condemn Paul and Paul stood up and said, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, and for the hope of the resurrection I'm being questioned. And it says there was a great tumult and a riot, practically, between the uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees when he said that. And the Pharisees said, well, we find no fault in this man. Let him go. And the Sadducees were outraged by this man and said, put him to death. Let's kill him. Get rid of the scum. And there was a great division there. And so the Roman centurion, or the king, <coughs> So a riot was going to occur, and they took Paul away in safe, for safekeeping. And he finally appealed to Nero for uh, his case. Well, in this article, <coughs> the Enduring Sound Doctrine, <coughs> I feel it's a great title. Yes, we need to learn to endure with sound doctrine. That means, how do you do that? There's only one way I know to endure, be faithful to the end with sound doctrine, and that is to keep on studying. Keep on with an open mind and keep studying. So you keep learning and keep proving. So you can answer everybody, answer every rebuttal, answer every question. So you're never called into a state or pushed into a state of doubt or ignorance or darkness to endure sound doctrine you have to study the words of God the scriptures and understand them so use your Bible helps concordances and Bible dictionaries <coughs> use Jewish sources and know and know that you know don't take it for granted <coughs> So in his article, I would, you know, as Mr. Sexton says, a warning for us. Predicting the times in which we live, the Apostle Paul warned about times where they would not endure sound doctrine. Second Timothy 2, verse 3. Are we not living in a time where many people are not enduring sound doctrine? This is a time where many Bible teachers, he says, are greatly mistaken, like the Pharisees, I mean the Sadducees. He says, just look around. Just look around. How do we endure sound doctrine, he says. Jesus told us how. He says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him, and we'll come to him and make our home with him. John 14, verse 23. The word keep, he says, means to protect, to build up a fence around. Our understanding of God's truth is the pearl of great price. Well, no, I, I don't agree with that. Now he's starting to preach and give his own interpretations. What is a pearl of great price? I would say that includes the knowledge of salvation. The pearl of great price is God's promise of eternal life and salvation which includes then the knowledge of keeping the commandments, the law of God, and that Christ is the Redeemer, the Savior, the Messiah. All of that's part of the pearl of great price. It's not just our understanding of the Word of God, although that is also a pearl of great price. It's part of it. It's not the definition of it. But we do need to protect the Word of God, build a fence around it, not around our preconceived opinions and teachings and ideas from different churches, 
but around the scriptures themselves. You know, I can't get through to these men. Dennis Luker of the United Church or Roderick Meredith, I've spoken to both of them. I've written letters to them in the past. And even Raymond McNair, who's deceased now, but he was an old friend of mine. He, he just couldn't get it. They're all locked in on Herbert Armstrong. It's like Herbert Armstrong, right or wrong. They used to teach in the latter, latter years of World War Church of God, look to headquarters, follow Pasadena. Everybody keep your eyes on headquarters. Pasadena, California. None of them have their headquarters in Pasadena anymore. Global or Living Church is back in Charlotte, North Carolina now. United Church is wherever they are. I'm not even sure. But they're about the Great Lakes area, I think, or Cincinnati, or Cleveland, or somewhere, which is Ohio. But, uh, you know, headquarters is in heaven. Headquarters is at the throne of God where Jesus Christ is. That's the headquarters. And we need to look to him and look to his word, look to heaven, and not to men. Well, he goes on and says in Jeremiah 23, verse 29, God says, Is not my word like a fire and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? Well, the word of God is compared to that. That's what God said to Jeremiah. So he interprets it this way. What were the rocks that God's word breaks in pieces, he says? The words of false teachers who steal and twist what God has said. I don't see that in the Bible. What is it the word of God breaks in pieces? Everything that resists the word of God and the power of God. I would say the number one thing that God's word breaks in pieces is a hard, hardened human heart. The word of God is like a sharp sword, Paul says in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, that pierces to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. And it's like a hammer that hammers the opposition that enemy, false doctrines. False teachings and carnality in human nature. So going on with his, he says heresies recycle. And this is part that I got me the most <coughs> in this article. He says Satan is very good at recycling heresies. They worked well in the past. Well, of course he is. He's very experienced in uh, deceiving people from the time of Adam and Eve. He said, there are ideas now circulating today that have been making the rounds for a long time. Here's a few examples. So now we're going to get examples of modern day heresies <coughs> which trace all the way back to the days of the Apostles in this article. One, modalism. Now you say oh, modalism, what in the world is that? Well, he says that's the idea that God is one being with various modes of existence. Oh. Well, I don't know that I hear that around much today, but he says it is. <coughs> but he says nothing more about it. Then he says Arianism, number two. Teachings of the Greek Christian theologian Arius, A.D. 250 to 336. He asserted that Jesus Christ was a created being, raised by the Father and the, to the dignity of Son of God. He said these teachings deny the plain teaching of John 1.1. 1, 1. End of subject, end of discussion. And I would say, wait a minute! Is Christ a created being or not? Is he an angel that God created and then elevated and raised to the status of Son of God by begetting him? <coughs> <coughs> the 
Bible says in, in uh, the Revelation chapter 3 about the Laodicean church, Christ says, I am the beginning of the creation of God. And in Colossians chapter 1, it says that he is the firstborn of all creation. He came first in the creation. In the order of a series of creations, he was number one, first one created. Firstborn, first created. I have articles on that. It's also very clear. Christ said in the book of John, Chapter 14, my father is greater than I. If he and the father both existed for all eternity, forever and ever, and they're equal, how could the father be greater? If they're equal gods in the Godhead for all eternity, why would one be greater than the other? They'd be equal and there would be then uh, the potential for rivalry or for disagreement. Father's in charge. He is the original great creator. And then he created the Logos, the word which issued forth from him and became the Son of God, Jesus Christ. You know, I've written articles on this. It's a wonderful truth, and he, he just treats it like a heresy with one paragraph and says, just look at John 1 1. Well, I right, look at John 1 1. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay. John 1.1. 1, 1. I agree with that. <coughs> I agree with that completely. But notice it says, in the beginning. And actually, in the Greek, it says, in a beginning. There is no definite article. So, in the beginning, you're in a beginning, was a word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. Now, a word is something that comes forth you know, I speak a word, it comes forth from my mind and my heart and my mouth. It issues forth. That's what words are. They, they're articles of speech. So Christ said in, in John chapter 17, I believe it is, he said, I issued and came forth from my Father. Very interesting. And he says in the same chapter of John 17, he prays to the Father. Let me just, uh, let's just turn there and let's briefly read what Christ himself had to say in John 17. This is a great prayer that Christ gave before the crucifixion. Verse 1, he says, Father, the hour is come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may also glorify you. As you have given him, see, God the Father gave him this authority, so God the Father is the greater. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given to him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the Father, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So the only true original God is the Father. Christ is the Son of God because he came forth from the Father and is the Son. You know, my son came forth from my wife and I. If we hadn't gotten together, he would never have been born. But he came forth because of us, from us. Well, so, you know, <coughs> this article is trying to get people on the, keep them on the, on the straight and narrow path. But by doing so, he's following the Sadducees, who were themselves heretics. And Judaism says so. The Pharisees said so. And, and by their teaching of no resurrection and no existence of angels or those things, they proved themselves to be heretical, and then they kept the Pentecost on the wrong day every year, because they counted wrong. But the Pharisees were in charge of the temple practices, so all the Jews followed the Pharisees, except for the few Sadducees, who went their own way, but they were the rebels, 
that sense. So then he goes into Judaic ideas. Another thing he criticizes is calendar, <coughs> calendar controversies. New moon worship. <laughs> oh, he's accusing people of worshiping the new moon? Not, not, well, they don't really, do they? Not that I know of. He said, and sacred name controversies fall into the same category of Ju Ju Judaistic ideas. Some of these ideas, he says, cause division and confusion, neither of which is God the author of. That's bad English. You don't end a sentence with a preposition normally. He should have said, neither of which, uh, of which God is not the author. Not ending in a preposition of. We'll put the of sooner. But anyway, calendar controversies do come up. We need to be willing to study into the Word of God and analyze it and see what does the Scripture say about the calendar. They just ignore it and say we follow the Jews. <coughs> well, the Jews changed it in 357-358 A.D. They created a mathematical construct which approximates new moons to approximate the beginnings of months. And it's self-correcting every 19 years of the 19-year time cycle, but it's never absolute. They're always generally off a day or two because they're going by mathematics, not by the visible new moons, as cited by re responsible viewers in Jerusalem or Israel. Is that something we should be concerned about? Well, I think we need to be concerned about the Word of God. What does God say? What does Christ say? What does the Word of God teach us? And it teaches us that the month is a new moon. The word for Hebrew for, for month is Kodesh, which also is the word for new moon. And that's the way they always kept it in biblical days by looking to the first faint crescent of the new moon, then declaring it by, in by the calendar committee in Jerusalem. And that was how they did it in the days of Moses, and they did it in the days of David, and they did it in the days of Christ and the apostles. Are we going to get back to the faith once delivered to the saints? Are we going to sit on our backsides and just pretend to be Christian and obedient to God? Well, I know for me and my family, we're going to obey God and we're going to follow Christ and the apostles. They kept the new moons as they recited from Jerusalem and Israel. He said, the Pharisees said in Moses' seat, today... The Jews back in Israel haven't returned to the true calendar yet, but the Karaites have, to a degree. They at least keep the new moons. They observe the new moons every month and declare them, and they've learned how to do it, and they do it very well, and they put that on the Internet, on their websites, and so we can know every month exactly when the month occurs. Well, then you can get into these other things, but he just, you know... I just get so tired of these people that have this attitude of we're the righteous ones, follow us, endure our teaching, which is sound doctrine. And they expect you to just go right along like a bunch of lemmings and follow them like a group of lemmings as they dive over the cliff. Because he's not proving any of this. He's just basically saying, follow us, we have sound doctrine. And my wife said this morning, well... <coughs> <clears throat> she said, well, you know, that church has been split. They recently divided just this past year. Uh, maybe about half of them left, or 30% left, to form another church. Church of God, West, uh, uh, Western Association, or whatever, Worldwide Association. And uh, they split off. So now they're all kind of subdividing and like amoebas and splitting off. And, and the one thing we all need to do to avoid deception in these last days is to take it to heart 
and to study the scriptures, not any particular church, to study the scriptures and analyze what they teach and read and study the word of God and Bible studies and helps, concordances, whatever, and ask God for help, for the guidance of his spirit and for his divine protection for your mind and your heart so you don't get led astray. Because many are being led astray and being led off in the foolishness and folly today. And so, like the Sadducees, he says, he says, sadly, the Sadducees who confronted Christ admitted that he answered them well, it says in Luke chapter 20 and verse 40. But they did not change their beliefs. Some months later, the same men held on to their pet ideas and disagreed that there would be a resurrection. They remained greatly mistaken, he says. Well, that's, my, that's what I'm thinking here. There's a lot of people in the end-time churches of God today. They remain greatly mistaken. They remain mired in their belief system, which is incorrect. They remain following false doctrines of Herbert Armstrong. He learned some truth. God revealed some knowledge to him for that time, like paganism of Christmas and Easter and Halloween, you know, different things that he learned that we didn't know before. We, I appreciate the things I learned back in those days. I learned them by studying the scriptures. He used to say, don't believe me or any man. Believe what you find in your own Bible. Blow the dust off your Bible. Read the Bible. I've been doing that ever since. That was 50 years ago. I'm still reading the Bible. I hope there's no dust accumulated on it. <laughs> I'm reading it, studying it. You know, and I find it's inspiring and profitable for doctrine, instruction, reproof, rebuke, and instruction in righteousness. As Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. <clears throat> and we need to get back to the Bible, literally, and recapture the faith once delivered to the saints. So he says, they remain greatly mistaken. And I have to say, brethren, he and his church remain greatly mistaken. <coughs> because they're following the Sadducees. When it comes to Pentecost and the Holy Days, they're, they're following them on that critical juncture, and they're following the uh, Herbert Armstrong and other things that he just did not understand right. So he says, finally, we, are li we live in trying times. The political world appears to be coming apart. The Great Tribulation is on the horizon, and Satan knows that he has but a short time. Difficult challenges are ahead. Are you going to endure sound doctrine? End of article. Well, I agree with that whole paragraph. Yes, we're living in trying times. Difficult days lie ahead. Great tribulation is on the horizon. This is already beginning. So how do we endure sound doctrine? By just listening to a man and reading his article? No by studying the Word of God. Isaiah chapter 8 gives us the key to enduring to the end. Isaiah chapter 8, and verse 20. The prophet says, beginning in verse 15, And many among them shall stumble, people are stumbling all around us today. They shall fall and be broken and be snared and taken, taken captive. Taken captive in their beliefs and their belief structure and their assumptions. Many shall stumble and fall and be broken, be snared and be taken captive. Taken. Verse 16 then says, Bind up the testimony seal the law, the Torah, among my disciples. 
I will wait on the Lord, Yahweh, I'll wait for him, who hides his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. And then down in verse 19, And when they say to you, Go looking, and seek those who are mediums, and witches, and wizards, and warlocks, and those who are whisper in the ear, and mutter, what they're saying. When they say to that, should not a people seek their God during hard times and difficult times and times of testing and travail and tribulation? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? Are you going to go to witches and witchcraft and try to commune in seances with dead people to know how to live? That's not the answer. But verse 20 says, To the law, the Torah, the law of God, the Old Testament, and to the testimony, the testimony regarding Jesus Christ, Yeshua the Messiah, to the law, the Old Testament, and the testimony regarding Yeshua, the whole New Testament, those together, that they do not speak to this according to this word, he says, it is because there is no light in them. No light, only darkness. And so they suffer as a result. So we need to seek first to God. And trust in Him. And then we can have and endure sound doctrine, but we have to study and persevere. The endurance means to persevere. Sound doctrine comes through study and appraising and carefully evaluating and analyzing what we're taught and not just taking somebody's word for it in a glossy article. And now and I want to go to another letter that I got this week. <clears throat> it says, I hope you're having a special Sabbath. I've often Oh, I read that part of it already, but I can't go on further in the article. Nevertheless, he says, I read your article on the comet Ison with interest. That was on the internet now. I recall seeing comet Haley, <clears throat> or Halley's comet, Haley's comet, back in 1986 with a pair of novelty binoculars with my mom, and it was truly special. So I'm anticipating, along with many, that Ison will pan out as predicted and light up the sky like the moon. It would be awesome, but it wouldn't surprise me if due to its proximity to the sun, when it turns to approach us, that it'll flicker rather than flame. Of course, I hope it won't. Now the reason of why I'm writing you is it got me thinking. I've had a theory of sorts on comets since they have traditionally been looked upon as omens. So I'd like to share with you my own theory as I've always wondered if they were harbingers of war. For instance, Haley or Halley showed up in 1910. Four years later, the world was plunged into war, World War I. In 1986, it again showed up. Four years later was the Gulf War. In 1997, Hale-Bopp showed up. Four years later was 9-11, bombing of the trade towers in New York City, leading to the ongoing War on Terror. So I speculate if Ison will fulfill its role as the Comet of the Century in 2013 and 14. I also read the article in Rabbi Judah Ben Samuel's predictions on your site and noted that according to his prediction, 2017-18 may be a jubilee year. And I've been saying that uh, for, for a couple of years now. 
that if you look at the fulfillment of prophecy, the Jubilee years could very well be because prophecy began to be fulfilled again, let's say, in the latter days <clears throat> with the fulfillment of the prophesied punishment on Judah or the Jews. They went in captivity in 604 B.C. And 2,520 years later, seven times, which is seven times 360 days in a biblical year, prophetic year, that's 2,520 days, a day for a year. Subtract that from 607, 604 B.C. and brings you to 1917, when the British reconquered Jerusalem and took it away from the Turkish Empire. The Ottoman Empire in 1917. Now a jubilee from then, 1917-18, because the Hebrew year crosses the Roman year. If you start from that count, countdown then and count 50 years, then the next jubilee was 1967-68. That's when the Six Day War occurred in Israel. And they recaptured the Golan Heights and the west bank of the Jordan River and the old city of Jerusalem and the Sinai Peninsula. Especially the old city of Jerusalem with the Temple Mount. On that Jubilee year. Count another Jubilee year from then it brings you to 2017 slash 18. Could that be the final Jubilee year in the countdown? for the coming of the Messiah. God's people are now back in Israel. They recaptured and took over the old city of Jerusalem and the Temple Mount. The end of the next Jubilee period of 50 years brings us to 2017-18 and the Messiah. And it says in the book of uh, well Christ said in the book of Matthew and Luke also that in the last days, the last generation, to be like the fig tree. The last generation. And Israel would grow like the fig tree. Well, they had to be back in Israel. Israel was reconstituted as a nation state by the UN mandate in 1947 and then declared this independence as a state and uh, May 14, 1948. And a generation in Bible language, in Psalm, according to Psalm 90, is 70 years. So 70 years from 1947-48 brings us to 2017-2018. And he said, all these things will happen to that generation. Well, that's interesting because today I picked up the prophecy in the news for February 2013. And the lead article is by Gary Stearman. And he talks, his title is, Is Ours the Last Generation? And he goes into a subject which I want to touch on lightly. But Christ said in Luke 21, 29 through 32, Behold the fig tree and all the trees. When they now shoot forth, you see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise you, when you see these things come to pass, know you the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away until everything is fulfilled. It's all going to be fulfilled in this generation. One generation. 70 year generation. Notice that this text says the words of the Messiah. Not only are we to watch the fig tree, Israel, stands for Israel, but we are to watch the other trees as well as they shoot forth. 
Well, on April 25, 1947, representatives from 50 nations met at San Francisco at the United Nations Conference. They agreed on the 25th day of June of that year to organize the United Nations Charter. Three years later, 1948, the membership had grown to 58 nations. In 1949, they added another member, Israel, bringing the total to 59 nations. Since then, by 1960, there were 99 nations. By 1970, there was 127 nations. They were bursting forth. The year 2000 saw 189 nations in the UN roster. And it's remained nearly stable since then, with now 193 nations in the UN. The rapid growth beat, meets the biblical prediction that they would shoot forth which they have done. And now, talking about a generation, the last generation and the last days. The scriptures in the Old Testament uses an expression. In Hebrew, it's Hador Ha'akaron. Hador Ha'akaron. This is first found in Deuteronomy in a prophecy describing the future dispersion of Israel and the Jews. He calls it the generation to come. Hador Hakaron, the generation to come. So that generate so that the generation to come of your children shall rise up after you, and the stranger that shall come from a far land. And when they see the plagues of the land and the sicknesses, the Lord is laid upon it. Like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, which the Lord overthrew in his anger. And they ask, why has the Lord done these things to this land? Which means Deuteronomy 29, 22 through 24. Now the term Hador HaAkaron can just as easily be translated the last generation because the word Akaron means hindmost, last in order, last of a series, or simply last. So Hador HaAkaron means literally the last in a series of generations the hindmost generation or the last generation. And that's what the prophecy is talking about. Our day today. Psalm 48, 11 through 14. It says, Let Mount Zion rejoice. Let the daughters of Judah be glad because of your judgments. Walk about Zion. Mark you well her bulwarks. Consider her palaces that you may tell it to the generation following, to the last generation, to the last in the series, the final generation. For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto death, even to the end of the world, even through the final last generation. So this phrase, the generation following, is Hador Akaron or Lador Akaron. The term Akaron means last of an order or last. This is a reference to the generation that would return to Israel and see the rebuilding of the landmarks in Israel with palaces and walls and towers. That's what the Jews have been doing for this and during this final generation in Israel. And also, Psalm 78 is another reference. God says, Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable and utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. 
we will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come, the last generation, the final generation, the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come, the last generation, the final generation, Hador HaAkaron, might know them, even the children who should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children. Psalm 78, 1 through 6. Also talking about the last generation. In these verses, this time we find two occurrences of the phrase Lador Akaro, referring to the last generation. Note that the Lord is making an impassioned appeal to this last generation. He asks them to listen and understand the ancient words, the dark sayings, the parables of Scripture. There they will find these dark sayings. That is, they are to search the Scriptures for the hidden inner meanings that will illuminate God's plan for the last days and for the future. Chiefly these are the messianic prophecies which have been hidden from Israel for many generations. Now, this in this final last generation, the people of God are urged by God to look directly and deeply into the dark sayings of Scripture, the parables and prophecies, so that we will be prepared for that which is shortly to come to pass. I have to search the scriptures. Don't take what men say for granted. Understand the dark sayings of old, from ancient times, the words of God. Psalm 102, verses 12 through 18. The psalmist says, But you, O God, shall endure forever, and your remembrance to all generations. You shall arise and have mercy upon Zion for the time to favor, he, favor her, yea, the set time, the set time that God has set has come. The set time to be fulfilled for the kingdom of God has come. For the, your servants take pleasure in her stones, the stones of Jerusalem and favor the dust thereof. So the heathen shall fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth your glory. When the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. He's talking about the second coming, the coming of Christ, to appear in glory, to build up Zion and the church, spiritual Zion. He will regard the prayer of the destitute and not despise their prayer. This shall be written for the generation to come. This is for the last generation, the final generation. This is it. The door Akaron. This shall be written for the generation to come. The door Akaron the last generation and the people which shall be created shall praise the Lord. The people which shall be created shall praise the Lord. Psalm 102, 12 through 18. We read about a people being created in Revelation 7. 112,000 from each of the tribes of Israel and a great multitude from all nations are going to be created and set apart and set aside for the Lord in the last generation. Revelation 12, or rather chapter 7. Yet 
Gary Stearman says, it would be hard to find a prophecy as distinct and specific as this one. The rebuilding of Zion is all set out for the generation to come. The last generation. In other words, this, this generation. When Jesus Christ, Yeshua, told his disciples, that generation shall not pass away until all these things are fulfilled. He was talking about the generation of the fig tree and all the trees. He was talking about the last generation, the final generation, this generation. And I think it's laid out very clearly that he's talking about our generation. I was born in 1941, the year the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. The United Nations was created in 1945. Israel became a nation state in 1948. Seventy years from then brings us to 2017-2018. So I think we are living in the last generation. Personally, I don't think there's any doubt about it. And this brings up the question then of Daniel chapter 27. I'm sorry, Daniel chapter 9, in verse 27, the 70 weeks prophecy. In verse 27, Daniel speaks of a final week, a final Shavuah, which is a seven, the final seven, during which a treaty is to be confirmed with the many. And in the midst of that final week, or seven, meaning seven years, in the middle of it, up to three and a half years, an abomination of desolation is to take place. And the sacrifices are to cease at the holy temple and be interrupted, be stopped. And Revelation 13 says the beast will reign for three and a half years, a time, times, and half a time, or 42 months, which is 1260 days. Now, when is this going to occur? What is this prophecy in Daniel talking about? It says there in Daniel. 9.27 going back a bit it says and after 62 and 2 weeks shall Messiah be cut off that's when he died in 30 AD but not for himself <coughs> and the people <coughs> and the people that will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. That was Titus and Vespasian when the Romans came against Jerusalem in 70 AD. And the end thereof shall be with a flood, and until the end of the war, desolations are determined. And then it says, he, the prince of the Roman or in time empire, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he will cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations he will make it desolate. Now Christ Yeshua said in the Mount Olivet Prophecy, Matthew 24, that in the end time, right before his second coming, there would be an abomination of desolation set up in the holy place. Let him that readeth understand, he said. So we can expect a final week and a final abomination of desolation set up in the end time. And this is tied in with a treaty, it says. What is a treaty? A treaty is a covenant, an agreement. Now many have thought that, well, it's a peace agreement between Israel and the world. It doesn't say anything about peace. 
It doesn't say a peace agreement. It doesn't say that at all. It just says, He, the prince, shall make an agreement or treaty or covenant with many. I want to suggest a new thought. Brand new to me. But I think maybe it's right on. I've been wondering, well, what is this treaty? What is this covenant? What is this agreement that he, the prince, is going to become the beast, is going to make with many? And who are the many? It doesn't say. But what have we just witnessed? We just witnessed a man being elected to the most important office in the land of the world for the second time. A covenant is an agreement. Being elected president of the United States, the world's last superpower, is making a covenant of the man with the people, 300 million people, to rule over the land after putting the hand on the Bible and swearing before a Supreme Court justice. Not only did Obama just re do that in 2008, he reconfirmed that office and covenant in 2013. He was elected in 2012 and reconfirmed re re the covenant when he swore once again before the Supreme Court Justice on Inauguration Day. He was inaugurated January 20 and 21, 2013. Isn't that the confirming of a covenant with many? 300 million and before the eyes of the whole world? Meaning that we have one week, meaning that uh, seven years before the end? That is, if it goes on that long? Now, he's only confirmed for four years to be president, but after that, who knows what's going to happen? He will become the leader of the world, perhaps, and it will extend for inclusively seven years, counting 2012 when he was elected till the end. And this one, the Bible says, is going to have a mouth. What a mouth! His speech is a central fa factor of his makeup. The ability to convince an audience through superior rhetoric ranks among the highest gifts of mankind. Daniel 7, 7 through 8 says, In this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and he the mouth speaking great things. This leader, this ruler, this prince is going to have a special look in his eyes of discernment and cunning and a mouth that's famous for its rhetoric speaking great things. And he will arise to prominence. His rhetoric, Daniel 7, 22-22, is very great. He is the world's most convincing speaker. He uses speech to counter the teachings of the saints and the prophets of God. He leads the world into deception with the fluency of his mouth. His power is supernaturally expanded in scope to cover every culture and nationality on the earth. He will be the Iman Mahadi, or Mahdi, Buddha to the Hindus, Krishna to the Hindus, and to Christians he will be looked upon as the Messiah, the Christ. These things are now taking place in this generation, the last generation. So I think maybe we don't need to look for a future covenant. The covenant's been done. Then it was reconfirmed on Inauguration Day. 
and it would last till the end of the age, whenever unless God cuts it short, which Christ said He will cut the days short in Matthew twenty four. For the for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So I think we are living in the days of the end of the age, the last generation. We need to perk up. We need to examine the dark sayings of old and the prophecies and the parables and get back to the faith once delivered and to make haste and to pray to God earnestly that we might understand and be accounted worthy to escape the horrifying things to come upon the earth and to stand faithfully with joy before the Son of Man when he returns.